80% of the ammonia that is secreted from the cell, it comes in the form of urea. So the cell has a metabolic detoxification process known as the urea cycle. And the urea cycle basically is a way to sequester elevated levels of ammonium ion or ammonia, whose source comes from alpha amino acids. So this process actually prevents a very serious clinical condition known as hyperammonemia, elevated levels of ammonia in the blood, which uh, that ammonia can cross the blood-brain barrier and enter into the brain and elicit toxic effects. So I liken this to sort of a detoxification pathway. The pathway was originally deciphered by Krebs along with his colleagues, and we know Krebs from the Krebs cycle. So let's briefly go over the urea cycle. Here is the end product of urea, and um, the origins of all of these atoms uh, should be uh, of note. First, we have that C and O, the carbon and the oxygen. The carbon and the oxygen actually come from CO2 or bicarbonate, essentially equivalent, and that's pretty ubiquitous around the cell. The nitrogen in green, uh, that's important because, again, we're trying to remove um, amino groups to prevent hyperammonemia. This NH2 uh, actually is donated from aspartate, that amino acid. So uh, high levels of amino acid tend to signal high levels of two amino acids. One of them is glutamate, and the other one is aspartate. Those alpha amino groups tend to get put into these two amino acids as primary reservoirs. And this nitrogen in blue comes from the ammonium ion, which actually comes from oxidative deamination. The oxidative deamination usually occurs um, through the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase. Uh, there's also glutaminase that can give rise to some of the ammonia as well. So this process is intimately linked to uh, amino acid levels in the body. The urea cycle uh, is actually split between two components in the cell. The mitochondrial matrix, where the first two reactions are held, and then the reaction cycle is completed in the cytoplasm. So let's briefly go over the urea cycle. Shown here is uh, the mitochondria and its double membrane. Here is the bicarbonate, which is sort of ubiquitously found in all aspects of the cell. And that's going to react with the ammonium ion. So it may be worth reviewing oxidative deamination as well as two-step transamination to really figure out the origins of this ammonium ion. Uh, but generally, it comes from glutamate, which in turn came from two-step transamination. So look at the other video um, that talks about um, the transamination aspect uh, of, of this pathway. So the first reaction uh, produces carbamoyl phosphate. The enzyme that catalyzes this is the rate determining enzyme CPS1 or carbamoyl phosphate synthase 1. Uh, this is not to be confused with the cytoplasmic form, which is CPS synthase 2. That is involved in uh, the generation of cytosine, uracil, and thymine, the pyrimidine uh, biosynthesis. So CPS2 is very different than CPS1. This CPS1 is sequestered in the mitochondrial matrix. The reaction utilizes two ATP molecules to generate carbamoyl phosphate. So the molecule is primed, and it's going to react with the second uh, metabolite in the urea cycle, and that's ornithine. The structure of ornithine is very interesting because it has all the features of an amino acid, yet it's not encoded for by the genetic code and generally not incorporated into proteins. Uh, however, ornithine does have the alpha hydrogen, the alpha carbon, the alpha amino group, and the alpha carboxylate, and as well as the side chain, chime, excuse me, as well as the side chain. So all uh, aspects of an amino acid, standard amino acids, are found in ornithine. The carbamoyl phosphate will react with ornithine via this enzyme ornithine transcarbamylase. This enzyme has some clinical relevance. So this enzyme is called ornithine transcarbamylase. It reacts ornithine and carbamoyl phosphate to give you this other molecule known as citrulline. Citrulline, too, has features of an amino acid, the alpha carbon, to which the alpha hydrogen, alpha amino, and alpha carboxylate is attached, as well as the side chain.
The citrulline actually gets transported out of the mitochondrial matrix through the double membrane into the cytoplasm. So this is the second place, or the second phase of the reaction, uh, where this cycle takes, this urea cycle takes place in two places within the cell. So not really compartmentalized as with other metabolic reactions that we have studied. The citrulline gets exported out through a solute transport carrier into the cytoplasm, where that citrulline will react with the amino acid aspartate. Now, if you take a look at that blue uh, NH2, that blue NH2 along with that green NH2 are going to be the origins for the nitrogens uh, that will go and get incorporated into the final excreted product of urea. So the citrulline will react with aspartate. So you can imagine if there's high levels of aspartate, it will, it will react with citrulline. The enzyme that catalyzes their formation or the joining of these two molecules is arginosuccinate synthetase, a reaction that requires ATP and gives you this adduct molecule known as arginosuccinate. This large adduct molecule is pretty unstable. However, there's an enzyme that will sort of cleave this bond and when that bond is cleaved, you're going to get the molecule fumarate as well as the amino acid arginine. So let's talk about the fate of this fumarate. You may have heard of that fumarate, uh, or you may remember this fumarate as being part of the TCA cycle in the mitochondria. That's true and very much valid, but there's also a cytoplasmic fumarase that takes that fumarate and converts it to malate. The malate gets converted to oxaloacetate via malate dehydrogenase in the cytoplasm. And finally, uh, that uh, oxaloacetate can get transaminated to aspartate. So actually within the cytoplasm, you have a way to self-perpetuate this uh, urea cycle within the cycle itself by converting fumarate to malate, malate to oxaloacetate, and transamination back to aspartate. So you have sort of a mini cycle within the entire urea cycle. So after arginosuccinate lyase cleaves arginosuccinate at this bond, you will get fumarate and arginine. Arginine is our standard typical amino acid that's encoded for by the genetic code. Arginase will come in and cleave it to give you ornithine and also your final product, urea. So in arginase, that water will come in and sort of cleave right at this bond. So the, uh, the water molecule sort of hydrates this bond right here. Water it, the water is going to hydrate right at this bond, giving you and yielding the amino acid ornithine, or the non-standard amino acid ornithine, as well as the final product, which is going to be, as well as the final product, which is going to be urea. So this ornithine can get transported back into the mitochondrial matrix and sort of fulfill the urea cycle all over again. So we have a transport of citrulline out and then a transport of ornithine back in to sort of fulfill and perpetuate the urea cycle. This pathway really starts to churn when there's high amino acid content. Um, the most important aspect in terms of regulation of the urea cycle is CPS1. CPS1 is actually uh, allosterically activated by the uh, effector molecule N-acetylglutamate. The uh, way this molecule, this effector molecule, is generated is through high amounts of the amino acid glutamate. So we remember glutamate as part of oxidative deamination. Uh, and high levels of that imply sort of high levels of ammonia because two-step transamination, one of the final products, is glutamate, as well as, as, well as acetyl-CoA. We have seen and encountered acetyl-CoA in the PDH multi-enzyme complex, which really implies the cell is in an oxidative phase, an ox energy generating phase. So the glutamate and acetyl-CoA, if they're in high enough concentrations, they will be substrate for the N-acetylglutamate synthase which generates N-acetylglutamate. The, acetyl, uh, the coenzyme A is, serves as the leaving group. So then this N-acetylglutamate is a polis positive allosteric activator, CPS1. It really increases flux through, or to, through the urea cycle. Some textbooks call it an obligate activator rather than an allosteric activator. There is a lot of urea cycle disorders that result from the uh, mutation or the 
uh, inefficiency of all of the five enzymes of the urea cycle. There's also deficiencies involved in the enzyme that creates the activator, N-acetylglutamate. And some common themes that you will see here is hyperammonemia and elevated levels of arginine, lysine, or ornithine, high levels of amino acids, high levels of ammonia that sort of seep out into the blood, and also some cases uh, really uh, leak into the cerebrospinal fluid as well. So uh, some commonalities with all of these mutations of these essential urea cycle enzymes are uh, acidosis, vomiting, lethargy, um, the inability to breathe, the sort of a commonality in all of the deficiencies with uh, urea cycle enzymes. Treatment also has a commonality. Usually it's very dietary. Um, you want to increase uh, carbohydrate and very much restrict proteins, except for the essential amino acids, because you still need uh, those uh, essential amino acids to carry out other aspects and other uh, metabolisms. Um, individuals tend not to live very long, or if they do, they have a very poor quality of life. So this is a quick overview of the urea cycle. Um, it's split between the mitochondria and the cytoplasm, five-step pathway with five enzymes associated with high levels of amino acids, uh, implicated in obviously high-protein diets. And again, we want to get rid of high levels of ammonia, uh, treat and target hyperammonemia so that it doesn't happen, and uh, get rid of the ammonia in a, into the soluble form of urea, which is easily excreted out into the urine. Thank you.